my background is actually in engineering, and I've been in architecture for more years than I care to, to disclose, actually. But um, it's been wonderful being in architecture and being an engineer in architecture. There's been tensions with, with colleagues from time to time, but there's also been fantastic insights and um, shared conversations. And it focuses your attention on other things. And Eladio Di Este, his background was as an engineer, but his breadth of scope of, of interest was, was beyond that, was beyond architecture. He was very concerned about the implications of technology in the developing country. And I kind of subtitled this, this session an awareness of form, because I believe that, that that's a good way to, to get into his work. There are many levels that one can, can understand his work. Um, from a technical point of view, from an architectural point of view, from, from a point of view of cultural and historic significance, from, from the point of view of sustainability, and, and there are things to find out in all of these things. And he wasn't terribly well known, um, partly because he focused his work in, in Uruguay, but also he was very keen to develop a language of construction which was appropriate to the country. And while people were developing lots of different types of forms, particularly with concrete in the middle of the 20th century, people like uh, Candela, people like um, Pierluigi Nervi, Eduardo Taroka, Heinz Eisler, as, as uh, Will has said, um, he turned his attention to concrete. To, right, he knew about concrete. He, he was a very well-educated man. But he saw in brick a, a different type of language, one that wasn't subservient to concrete, but actually, in many cases, was more effective. So an awareness of form, and a, a kind of subheadings here of generic in particular, he developed a number of techniques which he used repeatedly. And these tended to be for industrial types of buildings, so very pragmatic buildings. Uh, and then he also developed some really interesting architectural projects, which are... <coughs> essentially churches and raised shopping malls and things like that. We're not going to cover anything like the extent of his work in this session, but try to give a flavour of, of what it's about. So he died in 2000. Um, he was a Uruguayan engineer, innovator in bricks. He created a whole series of forms, vaults, towers, these undulating walls, applied in many different types of buildings. He formed this company, the Este Montanez, with his partner from university, Eugenio Montanez, in 1955. And they not only designed structures and buildings, but actually built them. So he was responsible from the conception through to the handover. And that was really important in his work. And this probably, this figure may be slightly out of date, but around about the time I was interested in the work a few years ago, they had built something like one and a half million square meters of, of building. And that's in Uruguay and, and a few places beyond, some in Brazil and, and a wee bit in Argentina, and latterly a few projects in Spain. Um, but Uruguay is a, is, a, is a small country. It's three and a half million people, so it's smaller than, than Scotland, um, which is quite interesting, but the size of Wales. Another interesting thing is that he converted to Catholicism when he was a teenager. He was brought up in an agnostic or atheist tradition. Uruguay... Um, was the first South American country to become secular in 1917, I think. So they separated the church and the state. And he wasn't brought up in the Catholic tradition, yet he went on to design a number of churches. And he converted when he was a teenager, when he moved from, from his hometown, Artigas, to, to Montevideo to study. Um, and there's been some interesting people writing about this uh, idea of his Catholicism and how it informed it, because it was also a very powerful physicist. He originally wanted to study physics at university, but engineering was the closest that was available at the University of Montevideo, so he studied that. But he believed that you could understand the nature of the world through, through physics. Uh, and, and so that sometimes, and I've not really resolved this in my own head, there's some kind of interesting correlation between his Catholicism and his understanding of physics, which we will see, hopefully, as we progress. He actually wrote four or five very interesting essays, and these are quite easily sourced. They're in a book by Stanford Anderson from MIT. There's also another book by uh, Torres Silas. And the, the 
are available in, in, in English translation. But there are some key ideas that you can take from these essays about structure. And he believed that, that uh, he talks in the last part of this, there's nothing more noble and elegant from an intellectual viewpoint to resist to form. So what he means by that is when he makes a structure, he wants the structure to do as much as it can. Not really rely on beams and columns, etc., but to rely on the shaping of the form to get the, the ideal system. And that, that led him to these complex three-dimensional geometries. Innovation, I believe we must contemplate each problem independently, keeping in mind the conditions of our circumstances and environment. There, what he's really saying is that I'm in a developing country, but I'm not stupid. I understand things. I understand. I don't need to rely on technology from North America or from Europe. And to some extent, that explains why his work wasn't that particularly well known, because he didn't feel the need to go beyond his country to solve and create the forms that he needed. And then he was really interested in, in how we, architecture could, could shape space and also how it could respond to the, 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 the inherent nature of the materials and, and the way that it was constructed. So this is quite a well-known sketch by a, a, a famous Uruguayan abstract painter, uh, Cory Garcia, who created this thing called the School of the South. And this was quite influential in his thinking. And it relates to the second uh, equation that, we, that I presented about innovation and solving problems independently. And it envisaged Uruguay as not facing north, but facing south. So they're looking for a modern way of approaching art and design and in the, the SDS case architecture that was contemporary, but also regional, responding to the, the, the spaces and the places that they came from. And, and that's been seen quite a lot. He fell into the use of brick um, for a number of reasons, very pragmatic in some cases, slighter than concrete. Uh, when you build something with brick, it's 90% of the material is already hardened, so it actually sets faster. And you can see that, actually, you can understand that. If you, if you built a couple of things at Edinburgh, which I helped to, to, to verify that, it ages well. It's easier to shape the double curvature. So some of the projects that he, he did, the formwork is relatively <laughs> straightforward. It's hydrothermal benefits. It's also a material which has a very long history and tradition. And out of that, he was trying to not do a, a, a re-evaluation of a traditional material, but create a contemporary material. And hopefully we'll, we'll see that as we go through. So some of the bricks that he would use were actually handmade. This is a brickworks in Montevideo where these are made in response to the, 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 the climatic cycles. The climatic cycles being when it's not raining and also when the, there's less work to do in agricultural uh, employment so that people who work in agriculture quite often come and make bricks for a period. And these are left to dry outside and then they're stacked into clamps underneath the, the, that shed. They dry a bit further and then they're fired. So it's a very elemental material. It comes from the earth and it's made by people that, that work the earth. One of the first sort of generic forms that he developed was the, the barrel vault, the single curvature vault. This time, instead of taking a circular geometry or whatever, he would use a catenary geometry because the physics would tell him that's the most efficient form. With a catenary, you get a geometry which is essentially um, places all the stresses in uniform tension or compression. In the case of an, a cable, it's in tension. In the case of an arch, it's in, in compression. So that's the, that's the, the most efficient geometry. Um, he would try to make them the minimum thickness. Often he would use prefabricated formwork that would be used repeatedly to, to be more efficient. And he would use this idea of resisting through form to shape the, the, the geometry of his pieces so that they would do more than one thing. Um, and then he was very concerned with how to express that. So he tried to avoid heavy buttressing. He tried to avoid tie rods, which would take the, the compression and, and the thrust from the compression out. Um, by shaping the forms as much as they could to form these edge beams. When he put windows in certain buildings, he tried to disassociate the window as much as possible from the rest of the wall and the, and the, and the vault. 
so that you would see the vault as clear, clearly as possible, the expression of the vault we've done that. And, and, and that was, that's something hopefully we'll see as well. So this was the first attempt at a vault, and it was with the architect Antonio Boni in the 1940s, who was designing these um, holiday accommodation in Punta del Este, which is on the, the coast of Montevideo on the Atlantic, and very popular with, with people from that area to have holiday homes. And originally they were planning to put in a concrete vault, and Vieste said, well, why not put a brick vault in? And the architect, Antonio Boni, said, well, that would just be thick and heavy, thinking of a traditional masonry vault, which would be quite massive. And he said, no, I'm really thinking of a shell. And here you can see the, um, have I the pointer somewhere? Anyway. Oh, I thought I had a pointer, but. Sorry. Oh, no, I just use it just, for, just as a pointer, that's fine. Yeah, but then that can work in place. Okay. Anyway, if you look at the top, you'll see that this is just a single brick thick. It's very slender, very thin. Uh, and that was what he was trying to express. The geometry is the catenary. It's taken from the hanging cable, inverted. And that, that gives you the, that provides the, the optimum form. And then he extended that, he developed that, and this was prior, the Berlin Gary House was prior to the establishment of um, DSD and Montanez. But when DSD and Montanez formed, they started to pro progress into quite big, large scale buildings. And this is a, a, a building for a, a, a soft drinks company in Uruguay. And here you can see these barn vaults. And the geometry of the cross section is the catenary. You can see the organization of the bricks. But also, when you get a shape like that, it becomes very long and stiff. So it can act as a beam. And, oh, thank you. And so in this direction, a cross section here takes its shape from the catenary and it becomes an arch. But by considering it in the perpendicular direction, it's a very stiff beam. So you can use that to actually span between columns. And he elevates the, the vault above the wall, so there's a gap here deliberately. And then he expresses this further by having these massive cantilevers. Again, you see here, it's still only one brick in thickness, so it's a minimal material that can be used. It's got the optimum form, and then he's taking advantage of that to, to produce these incredibly long cantilevers. Some of these are 15 meters plus. Amazing forms. They're quite complicated technically, and he had to resolve a number of problems to, to deal with that. But he was driven by this idea of making the thing as efficient as possible and as expressive as possible. And when it comes to the windows, he really wants to separate the, the, the vault from the wall, so it's lifted off the wall. The wall takes a curve that corresponds to the curve of the, the vault, but doesn't follow it directly, and then the glazing is kept as minimal as possible with these very simple details built into a recess in the top of the, the, the masonry. So that there's no heavy framing around the window. So that when you see the, the, the vault cantilevering over the, the side of the wall, you, you, you see the depth and, and the extent of the vault. It's quite, quite interesting constructions. And in some cases, this is the, the entrance to the same place, to the to a uh, soft drinks factory, and the vault is actually a double cantilever. So this is about 12 or 13 meters from here to here, and from here to here, and it's simply sitting on top of these columns. There's three columns, and there's two vaults. And it wants to bend and break its back. And the masonry doesn't like tension. It really doesn't like tension. It's very weak in tension. So there's a lot of stuff going on that we don't see in the vault, quite sophisticated construction because he has to pre-compress the, the vault to allow it to bend without cracking. But he has to do it in such a way that doesn't increase the thickness noticeably. Otherwise, he's losing the benefit of the catenary geometry. We'll look at that in a minute. This, uh, this is actually a project in Spain that I went to see some years ago. 
and it was a, a, a series of these barrel vault as canopies. And you can see the construction. This is actually a metal formwork. And the bricks are laid onto the formwork. And then the mortar is placed in between. There's some light reinforcements from three or four millimeter diameter steel rods uh, are, are placed into the joints. And then once the, the brick is set, the vault is pulled, the, the formwork, sorry, is pulled down. And then it's moved to form another section. And during that time, this is acting as a, as a proper arch. In order to provide the, the support for the arch, the formwork here, the temporary <coughs> propping, supports both the vertical and resists the thrust. The arch wants to flatten out, wants to push out. And once that's set and the next section is put in, everything is pre-compressed and the, the, the vaults are actually cantilevered. This is quite an interesting sequence. So sequence of construction becomes quite critical in that as well. And this is a, a, a large project. Some of the projects he did were very large. There's projects in, in, in Porto Alegre where it's 50, 60,000 square meters of building. Um, and this is a, 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 an agricultural warehouse uh, not that far from Montevideo, and it uses these barrel vaults. And the building is what's that, about 100 meters long, and it's only got four rows of columns because the, the, the vault itself can span between these columns, and then it projects out to form this large cantilever. And then there was a small office building that was added afterwards and tucked underneath the, the, the vault itself. And so He's taking advantage to push the barrel vault as much as possible so that he, he has a, his limited amount of vertical structure as reasonably possible as well. And so from here to here, from that point to that point, the vault is actually a, a beam. But it also wants to act as an arch across the section. He has to control the thrusts along the length of the, the, the beam itself. So somewhere in the middle here, it's still wanting to push out. You could do that by putting brittices all the way along, but that would be counterintuitive to the way. So he does it by folding the edge of the, the vault. So he takes the vault and it comes around like that and then it goes horizontally. And that acts like a, a stiffener. It stops the, the vault spreading out and then transfers that force back to these columns. And you can see this is the, the, the later extension with this building underneath and then sitting underneath the, the main vault of the, of the warehouse. And the two pieces actually sail over each other. And here, this piece here, is a, is a detail of the edge beam. So that edge beam projects horizontally from the vault. And now this is wanting to push out that way. And it's resisted by this acting as a big horizontal beam to resist the horizontal component of the thrusts. So he's shaping the form to do everything possible. It's really clever and really interesting. Um, and that takes it back to, to the column where the th overall thrusts are transferred back to the ground. And you can see in the drawing here, the detail. So at 30 meters or 35 meter centers, there's one of these concrete buttresses. And then it picks up all of the thrust for the whole 100 meter length of the, the vault at these four points and takes it to the ground. So it's really trying to do as much with as little as possible, but in doing so creates really interesting expression. This is a bus station. These are taken last year. Um, uh, it's a bus station in a town called Salto, which is in the north of Uruguay. And you can see a whole sequence of these vaults sitting on, on top of these columns. And the double cantilever, the cantilever back was sort of balanced as a cantilever. But they're only sitting on the column. And what's interesting is to note that when you see most of these projects, the column sits direct, the vault sits directly onto the column. There's no big structural capping or headpiece because he wants the vault to read as a vault and, and he wants it to read as an element separate from the vertical support. So you could resolve this in different ways. And normally you think, well, all of the weight of this thing, which is 30-odd meters, is coming down onto that central point. 
I have to make it more robust, but he's got enough um, material there to do that. So he doesn't put any more in. And he's doing that because he wants to maintain this sense of expression. And at the edge, we have to reconcile the last piece of the, the, the thrust. Because these two thrust against each other, so they tend to cancel each other out. But then this one is going to be, has got nothing to react against. So he, he folds up the edge, as you see here, and pulls it there. And, and in this case, the, this flat part of the vault is rectangular, and it's picked up on this concrete edge beam. And he argues about this to do with um, maintaining a square plan or reflecting the this, this, this square plan of the, the space be, below, because the, the vault was actually quite low. It wasn't very high. And then when he, he does a se second bus station, so this is a second bus station, which is in the same place, actually. And the buses are so critical to, to Uruguay because they don't have any trains. Um, he, he, he resolves it in a different way because it's a much higher vault. And this thing about awareness of form, when he first designed this and first built it, there wasn't this extension on the roof. This was a later extension. And when they put this in and they put this white beam across the top, he was furious because it implied that, that the vaults were being held together by the beam. But that came in afterwards and they weren't held together by the beam. He didn't want to have ties. The ties were anti-aesthetic in his view. He was very concerned and quite upset about this. Um, nothing he could do about it, but he just had to live with it. But then when you look at the, the normal way it was resolved, so this beam stops there. He shapes this edge condition to deal with that. In this case, though, it actually follows the shape of the bending moment of the, of the, the edge as it takes the thrust. It is maximum at that point and then reduces towards the support. So the, he's tapering the form to do as, as much as it, as it needs to do. In order to get these vaults to work, in order to get them to span, 15 meters as a cantilever or 35 meters in between supports, he has to deal with the, 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 the bending that happens in the vault, the tensions that happen, the tensile stresses, and that's quite problematic. Brick is a really brittle material. It cracks very easily. Now, he used a, a he didn't use conventional bricklaying mortar. He used a, a, a 1 to 2.5 sand cement, but the sand was actually coarse sand, if you know about bricklaying, you, you, you tend to have a much finer graded sand because it's easier to lay the bricks with a mortar and a trowel, and whatever, with a trowel rather. Here he was using a, a, a much coarser <coughs> sand, which gave a much stronger connection, but they were still relatively weak. But he developed these pre-stressing methods to actually pre-compress the vault along its long axis so that it, it would take the bending without cracking. And Pre-stressing, before coming to the university, I used to work for a precast concrete company, and I knew quite a lot about pre-stressing, and it's quite a sophisticated process in the UK and in, in, in Europe and America, and you have expensive hydraulic jacks, and you have expensive details to anchor the, the stress and the, the wires and whatever, and he didn't have any of that. He developed his own techniques, um, and he used looped pre-stressing, and this shows at the top of one of the vaults. So the vault has been constructed. And if you remember the slide where we showed the vault under construction, then uh, it's, it's supported at the sides temporarily to do, do deal with the thrust of the self-weight of the, the, the catenary itself. But then on top of the, on the crown where the, you get maximum bending, then he lays this series of steel loops that are anchored into the brickwork. Then he puts a thin layer, usually about three centimeters of sand and cement, and leaves this opening, which he subsequently folds this mesh over and covers and protects that. And then these looped ends, he pinches them together. Now, by pinching them together, if you just think about the, the change of that line to that line, then you must stretch that. And you can calculate it quite easily about how much force you get by how much displacement you have from that point to that point. And that means all you have to do to pre-stress them is to pull them together. And he pulls them together, and then he 
binds them so that they can't move apart, and then he covers them with, with the sand and cement mortar render to finish it off. And it's really, really, really simple, but highly, highly effective. And he eliminates any heavy-duty anchorages or whatever, and he also keeps the thickness of the vault as minimum as possible. Again, it's partly to do with his awareness of form. And you can see the, the details here. So typically they would have a series of these loops in different places, gradually pulling them the in. And so before pre-stressing, they, they take this shape, they're parallel, they're displaced inwards, and as they do, this length increases and you stretch the wires. And in stretching the wires, you pre-compress the vault. And he built his own jack to do this. So that just straddles the loop, and as you turn the handle, this rod pulls the wires together. So it's not even hydraulic, it's just manually operated. And he pulls it together, and that's it, and it works. And he's built many, many structures this way. Now, to go on to this project, this is a particularly unusual project in his, his catalogue, um, and it bo borrows a lot from the Barn Vault, but it was conditioned by a set of particular circumstances. And it's a vault which, uh, again, is supported by a central structure. And it was originally intended to be the canopy for a, a petrol station. So this is the, the, the structure. It's known as the seagull because of the cross section. But this section has a form that comes from the barrel vault. So it's not a vault because it hasn't got the reactions at either end. But it's this remarkable construction that sits on the central column. And one of the things one thinks about is that this is kind of showing off, you know, what, why are you doing this? And actually, he was incredibly modest in his, his, his outlook, so it's not really about that. It's actually really pragmatic because it allows these large buses to turn into the space quite easily. So you can see that it's designed to suit the, the bus and this is the cross section. And it's 17, 18 meters long, sits in a central column, so it's, it's got to all sorts of things to deal with in terms of displacements and whatever. And it's connected at that point with a series of bars that run into this valley at this point where it's slightly thickened. And the interesting thing was that this petrol station, which is originally Shell, was taken over by another company, and they decided that they wanted to put their own standard um, kind of branding identity, you know, the kind of metal canopies that you see. So they wanted to knock it down. And the, the local people in Salto well, were, 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 were incensed by this because it had become a wee bit of a, a, a local figure point. And so Diestes San Antonio, who is a structural engineer, devised a scheme to move the whole thing. <coughs> so they built this temporary steel structure around the column punctured the vault, so you put holes in it, cut the column, the concrete column off, then lifted everything onto a truck and moved it across town and then placed it back down and built a new column underneath. So it's remarkable, it shows you how robust these things are. They're apparently flimsy. They appear flimsy, but actually to be able to do that, it shows great confidence in understanding the, the nature of the material and the, and how to, how to play around with it. So um, it's now a, a monument. It's no longer part of the petrol station. They've also cleaned off the white paint that was on it and renovated and repaired the holes that they put in. And it truly is a remarkable project. Uh, and you can see here again, the column ta tapers to the width of two bricks at the top, but modulates in so that it fits with everything, and it's designed to fit, and it's detailed. It's so carefully detailed to do that, um, and this is this now marks the entrance to the town. And I, I, I had seen and read about this many times, and I'd understood it worked, but I didn't actually get to see it until till last year for the first time, and it really is quite breathtaking. <coughs> um, it seems very audacious, but if you understand his work, it's kind of logical and rational as well. Not so much now that it's just a piece of sculpture. Before it was a roof, it's now a piece of sculpture. But it is quite, quite dramatic and um, quite significant to the place.
We've done a number of studies um, at Edinburgh on his work just to kind of get our own understanding of what he's done. And we built a single curvature vault with a very shallow span. We had some half scale bricks, real bricks, but only half the size of normal bricks. So it's like 35 millimeters or so, I think, thick. And we built a single vault to see if we could do what he said he could do. Now, one of the things that he'd said about brickwork was that you can strip the vault within a day. Because when you put the mortar in the joints between the, the brick, the brick actually sucks out the water. Now, this is known in bricklaying, and bricklayers often dip the bricks. And he said that because of that, the brick and the mortar starts to stiffen very quickly. And you can do that. So we did this, and we did it to try and explain that. We also built it on a steel frame so we could move it around. But actually, what we did find is that we could strip it within a day, and it remained in, intact. And we, we moved it around, and it is remarkably, remarkably thin. It's very shallow as well. The shallower the vault, the greater the forces, and the more, the more it wants to distort. If you have a, a, a deep vault, the, the forces are much less. So this is, a, this is the worst kind of condition for the vault. But it works, and, and there's a, my daughter, who's now no longer that size, is standing on it. She's actually hanging from the, from the roof. She's not really standing on it. But anyway, um, it was a really good experiment because we learned a lot about the, 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 the technique from that point of view. And we found also that when we were laying the mortar, within about five minutes, it was no longer workable. It was stiffening up so quick. So it proved his point. There's a big advantage of the brick over the concrete is that it actually sets faster. It's also lighter than concrete, maybe about 20% less mass. And that takes you on to a second of his generic forms, the, the Gaussian vault. And if you look at the mathematics for a, a, a catenary, because the geometry is, is the, the geometry it naturally wants to fall into, you get this uniform distribution of stresses, which is the most efficient way of transferring load. And if you have a vault where the, the rise of the vault is high relative to the, the span, then the stresses are quite low. As you decrease the height and increase the span, the stresses get much higher. They're still relatively low in relation to the compressive strength of the brick, but they become more problematic because they, they tend to want to buckle. They can, they can actually pop through. Um, I've not got a bit of paper, but if you imagine that you can get, if you get a very flat vault, um, it starts to collapse under its own weight, not because the stresses are high, but because the geometry is not, is not properly sorted out. So the ST, in order to increase the span of the vaults, so sometimes these are 30, 40 meter spans, there's still only one brick thick. If he makes them a height corresponding to a barrel vault, they would be 15, 20 meters high. It's not practical. So he has to find another way of dealing with the the tendency to buckle. And he does that by creating what's called a, a Gaussian vault, and it's this doubly curved surface. So this is the formwork for one of these, and this is the application of one of these buildings. And what happens along the edge here, if you create a section along here, it's a straight line. But as you move towards the center of the vault, you get this increasing undulation. And that increasing undulation acts as a is a, is a rib that resists buckling. You displace the geometry and you, you end up having a, a stiffening effect. So he does this with the, with, with the least amount of work. And each of these sections through the vault, each of these curves, if you imagine a series of curves coming across here, which are shown in this diagram, each one of those is a catenary. So each one of those can be determined by hanging a cable and just increasing the the height or decreasing the height. And then by gradually varying them along the sides, along this edge, you end up by describing a, a doubly curved surface. And that doubly curved surface starts from a straight line and undulates more and more till it gets to the center. It's a quite complex form, but it's actually relatively easy to determine. And then formwork is made to follow that shape and the bricks are laid to follow. And they gradually follow that shape quite easily. And they, they have a, hand, a span to height ratio of about 10, which means that they're, they're quite shallow. And um, 
He's built structures up to 50 meters span. So these are structures that are 50 meters, but they're only this thick. They're only one brick thick. It's a remarkably thin construction, remarkably robust. And it comes from this constant repetition and re building and understanding the material, getting more and more confident to push the, the, the spans and the designs further and further. And this is an example in a gymnasium sitting on a concrete structure. You can see the undulations here. And you have a series of, there's a series of waves that take place. And each one of these is one formwork. And so to make it efficient, the formwork is used repeatedly. So, so you might use the formwork eight or 10 times. And you, one vault is, is, is built if, after the other. And the advantage of the brick setting faster than concrete means the construction can be faster as well. Here, he, he always tries to avoid ties because the vault obviously wants to push out on top of the, col the, the, the concrete structure. And you can do that by simply running a steel rod across the, the, the top of the columns. But that, again, it dis really disrupts the space. So in this case, there's a tie which is placed externally. So the column extends up beyond this, and there's a tie external to it, so it's not seen internally. But it's a fantastic way of controlling light into the building. <coughs> so between each successive wave, there's a, a, a crescent-shaped window. And these were used, as I say, in many, many projects, particularly uh, industrial, agricultural type projects, to bring in a soft light into the building as well. Each project was a learning device for the next. And the mathematics and uh, the structure and behavior of these things is really quite complex. And the SD, over a period of years, developed his own mathematical um, calculation procedure for this, which is not really discussed very much. But he actually wrote two books on this, which are available in Spanish. And in order to understand how effective these things were, he would test the, the vaults as they were being built. So this is actually a load test. And th these guys are the load. You can see they're relatively evenly spaced, and they've just lifted or dropped the, the formwork from this. So there may be a, a, a gap of about I don't know, 10 centimeters or something, not very much, but still relatively safe. But he's measuring how much they move. And Dest is actually standing right at the crown there. So through the process of building, he's actually really learning and understanding what his structures do. And, and the movement of these things was really quite, quite small. Um, one of the biggest projects in terms of span was this project for Montevideo Warehouse. So this is on the docks at Montevideo. It's a big, big warehouse. And originally, it had a timber roof which caught fire. Fire was irreparable. And the SD was called in to, 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 to suggest solutions. So he suggested building a, a Gaussian vault that spanned between the existing walls. And this is just under 40, 50 meters in span across. So it's an enormous project. Um, and it's hard to get a scale of this. But you, know, you can see from the cars and whatever, there's a big building. And the, these are the walls. These were repaired. And then installed in it was a series of Gaussian vaults. I think there's 14 in total. And so this is a, a section along the center line, the central axis of the building. And then at the the center of the vault, this is the construction. It's using a hollow clay pot as the brick. And again, this is about 13 or 14 centimeters in thickness, but it's spanning uh, 50 meters. And <coughs> this undulated form gives it tremendous resistance against buckling. And we've done some work on this as well using sort of some computer modeling, and we checked that. Because it, he was fixing to existing walls, he had to incorporate the ties. But there's no internal structure in this building at all. It's completely column-free. So it's 50 meters by about 80 or 90 meters with no columns in it. So it makes a much better uh, space for storing from the, from the boats that are coming in out of Montevideo. 
And as I say, we did a, a modeling study. We used a finite element technique, a system called Abacus, which allowed us to predict when it would buckle, actually, when it would collapse. And it gives you a factor of safety against buckling under its own weight. And we, or the computer told us this was about 4.3. And the Estes own methodology, which was a kind of um, partial theoretical and partial uh, series of tables that he'd produced, uh, suggested 3.8. So it's got a reasonable margin of safety. We also compared the analysis and we can see why it resists the buckling because actually it shares load. If you look at the catenary equation, which assumes that it's just a series of individual catenaries, we see that we get certain values of the force at different points, at the springing and at the crown. The crown is the center at this point, and the springing is at the supports. Then the, the, the FE model and the catenary are, are different. But that's because load is transferred across the different sections. So at this point, A, which is that point, the theoretical force is a bit lower than the B, which is the lowest curve. But then in the FE model shows that that changes. We reduce this force and increase this force so that the geometry is, is actually stiffening up the weakest parts of the, of the vault, which is what you would expect. And he, he, between the joints in these, there's some fine four or five millimeter diameter steel rod that helps to shed the, and transfer load across. And it's now 40 years old, I think, since they've done this. Again, what's interesting is when it comes to the gable walls, the, the side walls, or the end walls rather, he disassociates the vault from the, the wall, putting his large glazed windows in. So he's showing that the structure's doing all the work. It's not relying on the walls to, to support it at the end. So this, free, this is a free edge, and just a, a single piece of, a single glazed um, windows in there, with minimal framing. And the same at the other end, although the geometry is slightly different. So there's this thing about the generic, um, the generic typologies that he developed that were really pragmatic. They're still very expressive. And the most sort of pragmatic application were, the, were these horizontal silos. The Uruguay relies very much on its agriculture for its economy. And so they produce lots of things. Um, and you have to store and distribute um, large amounts of agricultural products. So the storage buildings are very important. And he used this to create these functional buildings, which have got no people in them. They're just stored drain. But they're quite remarkable in their own right. Sol Cyro and Nueva Parmia, which is one of the more recent projects, is incredibly large. And this is built near the River Plate. This is the formwork being constructed. And this is the formwork installed. And it's designed that the whole formwork can lift and lower and move along the axis of the building and then be pushed in. And they build and then cast, strip, and move and back in again. So it's a highly efficient process for an incredibly functional building. And we, here we see the, the, the building being constructed. And you have a moving platform for the bricklayers or the people constructing it to put the reinforcement in and bond and lay the blocks in place, the brick pieces in place. These are, I've been inside one of these before, and they're, they're, they're like a cathedral. It's a big, big space. But there's no windows, it's dark. You know, there's a few bulbs and whatever. But they're remarkable buildings. Remarkable, and they're literally eggshell thickness and scale. So it shows the, 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 the technology at its best in some ways. The minimal amount of material, the minimum amount of effort to produce the maximum amount of volume. He also built a number of towers. This is a TV mast, a communications mast, a place called Maldonado, which is along the coast further north from Montevideo. And again, this tower, which is tapered conical tower, is built entirely of brick. And it's actually easier to build than concrete. It's 64 meters high, but at the base it's only three and a half meters in diameter. It's, it, it, this incredibly slender tower in a coastal location. So 
quite high winds. And there's a series of tapered slots that are cut into the brick. And these get narrower and narrower as the, the, the tower tapers. So this piece of brick here is always the same thickness all the way up. The only thing it changes is the gap in between. And this is built without formwork. If you're imagining building this in concrete, you would have to have some form of tapering formwork on the inside and the outside. It should be quite difficult to do. But this is built by people laying bricks one on top of the other. And these slots, what's really interesting, they help to reduce the wind load because they allow a wee bit of flow through. But they also actually act as, as spaces to put beams through to hold a platform in order to build. So it builds itself. The, the formwork climbs with the, with, the, with, the, with the tower. It's a really clever piece of construction. And he used this to build many different types of towers, water towers, etc. And Uruguay is a very flat country, and it's relies on its, as I say, it relies on its agriculture. So water is really, really important. And you see many of these projects in various places dotted around Uruguay, different types of forms and whatever. Sometimes they've made solid ones. And then again, these tapered towers. And then at this point, the tank actually starts. And it's brick as well. So the whole thing is brick, built in a, a relatively simple and uh, apparently simple but highly rational way. Moving on to some of the particular types of projects, um, his most famous project by, by a long way is the, the Church of Jesus Christ the Worker in Atlantida. And he, he described this as his school of architecture. And it's a remarkable small church um, with quite a, quite a history. And it's probably certainly the most well known. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet about this. You will care to look for it. And there was a chap, a quite well known benefactor, who ran catechism and Bible classes for the local population. The local population were largely uh, agricultural workers or domestic workers because of it being quite near the sea and whatever. And he wanted to build a church. And he approached the Este about building the church. And the Este said, well, okay, um, let, me, let me have a chat with your, your architect. He says, no architect, we don't want an architect. The architect will make the building expensive. And, and, and I just want a building that people can go into. And he said, but the Este said, well, the church should be, should be beautiful. And he said, well, actually, the poor can't afford beauty. So the Este actually refused to build it. He wouldn't build it. And there was a correspondence in a backwards and forwards over a, a year or two, a few years. And the Este eventually agreed, provided he could design it. So he took on board the design. He was going to build it. And a... Uh, that's, that's what happened, and he, I don't think he ever got a fee for the design, but he got the fee for the, the construction. And it's, it really is a, 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 a very interesting building. And this is the front facade <laughs> of the building, and it's characterized by these walls, which undulate along the either side of the, the church. And then what's interesting about the <coughs> facade is that the front facade is that that is actually the section of the church as well. If you read the front facade, you're actually reading the section as well because you can see this repeated throughout as you go inside. And so when you look inside, the walls on the inside are very similar to the walls on the outside. The only thing that separates them is the thickness of the brick, which is, you know, about 20 centimeters in thickness. And this, these walls, Start off with a, a straight line at the base, and then increase in curvature as you get to the to the to, to the eaves. So it's like a kind of folding. We we're talking earlier, a wee bit like textile. It's got the sense of of movement there. And at one level, you think this is a really difficult thing to do. And again, if you were building it in concrete, it would be really difficult to do to try to create that shape. You have to create it in plywood or or, or board, but the the walls are changing in shape. So all the board would have to be cut to taper. So it would be really difficult. But building it in brick, when you're laying one brick after the other, it's actually much, much easier. And, and there are people now getting robots to lay bricks into complex shapes. But this is as complex as a lot of the shapes that you see 
robots laying bricks, but it's done in the conventional sense. The, the important thing is how to define that surface so that the brick layer can follow it. And the results are quite spectacular. When you're inside, it's, it's, it's had a renovation. It was built, I think, in 1960. And um, it's now a, a, a listed monument in, in Uruguay. And you see the walls, which undulate. The roof is also a Gaussian vault, so it's a doubly curved surface as well. And what I find really interesting is sometimes when you try to work it out, when you see that curved surface meeting that curved surface, you think, how are these reconciled? You get curvature in one direction and curvature in the perpendicular direction. Yet they come together with no change, no filler strip, no banding that allows you to absorb differences. The surfaces run one into the other. This is quite remarkable. And this was at a time slightly prior to what they call Vatican, what became known as Vatican II, which was the Catholic Church trying to, 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 to um, modernize. And the Vatican II introduced so many changes to do with, instead of having the Mass in Latin, it would be Mass in the vernacular language. To, it, it, it wanted to bring together the, the clergy, the priests, with the, 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 with the, with the people, so that they weren't separated the way they would be in a, a traditional church. So that was also informing what was getting involved here. Diesty was concerned that the Catholic Church should respond to changes to make the people more involved in the, in the service. And this wall, this sort of horseshoe-shaped wall, is, the, is a deliberate attempt by the SD to actually force the priest to address the congregation. Now, in a traditional church, a basilical church, the priest would enter the, the altar from the side. So he, you wouldn't, there wouldn't be any announcement that he was coming in. He would just enter from that. That space was his space. It wasn't the space of the congregation. By, Rearranging the plan uh, to resolve that, he was forcing this dialogue between the, the, the clergy and the congregation, which was embedded in the ideas behind Vatican II. And as I say, these, the, the, the construction of these things is quite remarkable. This is the, the junction, as I say, we looked at earlier, and this is also on the outside. And the reconciliation of the geometry is done through this <coughs> edge beam which sits on top of the wall. So that edge beam is not visible inside. It starts from the outside and projects out, and it ties the roof and the wall together. So that inside, it seems there's no, there's no apparent change. There's one surface just crashing into another. And you see the plan of the church. This is, the, this is where the priest would prepare, and he would have to walk down here and face the congregation before going into the, into the altar itself. And then the, the plan, the section at the ground floor, and the, sorry, the ground level, and that the roof is delineated by the, the dark line and the, the, the open line. And the wall gradually changes geometry. So there's an awful lot in this, and, and this building had to be low cost, it had to be economic, otherwise the, build, the benefactor wasn't going to, to fund it. So he used a lot of his skills as a builder to, to resolve that. Um, and you see the section here. Also, here underground there's a, is the baptistry, where babies would be baptized, or people entering, the, <coughs> not necessarily just babies, but people wanting to join the Catholic faith. And this was symbolic that you enter the church from underground and rise up into the, the body of the church once you've been baptized, which is part of what baptism is supposed to signify. If you look at this section, which is the, the, the section here, and then the undulated wall in the background in the distance, that actually follows the bending moment diagram of a, a framed building. So all this undulated wall, the Gaussian vault, the meeting of the, the walls themselves, actually is completely structural in its performance. There's no additional frame. The wall is 20 centimetres thick. The geometry and the shape, resisting through form, creates the depth that gives it its resistance to bending which is quite interesting. And then here is the plan at the top of the wall with this projected beam. And at this point, there are, ta there are cables that run all the way across from one side of the building to the other that tie the walls together. And they're embedded in the brick construction. 
and here we see the construction. Now, to define the geometry of these walls is simply a series of displacing a series of vertical lines. So if I take a series of vertical lines that follow the plan line of the wall, and then I displace them at angles, and these angles vary, that defines a curved surface which the brick layers follow. So it's, it, it, it's actually relatively straightforward in its execution. The precision that has to be undertaken in its construction is really quite profound, though. You can see that the, these walls are built first. There's a formwork for the Gaussian vault. And that has to be a constant across the various waves of the walls themselves and lifted into place. You can see the walls are freestanding initially and then the formwork in the distance. And then uh, a, bit, a better shot, actually. So these little frames are spacing the walls setting out the walls either side of the, 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 the plan of the building and then into which the formwork is then placed. Now that formwork is used five or six times. So the spacing, has to, the height and the distance apart has to be very accurately resolved. But they're building independently of each other. It's quite complicated. It takes a lot of care in doing that. And the SD worked with the same people throughout his career that actually realized his buildings. There was a particular chap called Vittorio Vergolito, who was an Italian immigrant to Uruguay, who actually came from a, a, a very poor uh, rural background in Italy. And um, he wanted to, to work in buildings. And he understood, he wasn't very well educated, but he understood what Diesti was striving for. And Diesti was incredibly well educated in a whole, a whole variety of different areas. But the, these two had a, 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 a very interesting kind of almost, a, I don't know what the word would be, but they, they understood each other really, really fully. And Vergalito knew what he had to do to, to, to resolve the projects and, and get them finished. And he would recruit people locally to work on each project, but under his careful supervision. So you get these, these details are just quite, I think very profound actually in the way that they're talking about form and how form comes together. The, instinctively when you have complex geometries coming together, the, 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 the junctions are always the problem. You see a, there's a project in, in Edinburgh that really irritates me, which is the dynamic earth, which is a tension fabric structure with a glass roof. And the reconciliation of the junction between the glass and the fabric it's just not really well done at all. It's just a complete, you feel as if it's been completely left to the last minute. This is actually embedded in the concept of the building from the start in order to get that relationship. And the, the, there's so many other things. The, the, the wall at the back of the, the, the church, again, is, a, is, is designed to, with a series of inclined bricks which reflect light in a particular way. So there's lots of different things that that we can't go into in much detail here, but if you have the time to go and study and look at the photographs, you see lots more. The second church that he was, well, not the second, but another church he was involved in is something that I've been spending a bit of time on recently, um, the Church of San Pedro in Durazno. Durazno is a small town about four, four hours from, from Montevideo, and it was originally a, a, a very traditional church. And again, in 1967, there was a, a, a fire uh, which damaged the roof quite badly, and Dieste was called in to, to propose a, a reconstruction, a, a repair, and effectively redesigned the whole of, almost all of the church in a really very dramatic way, and with technically very complex as well. So this was the, the original church, and this was built in about the end of the 19th century. And you can see that there's a facade here and then just basically a big shed behind it with this brick wall coming up. And then in 1925, I think it was 2025, they, they extended the facade and built this large piece on top. And they also built side aisles onto the, the church as well. So it was a major reconstruction and it was an anticipation of the, the church becoming a, a, a local 
a diocese becoming the main church for the area. And then after this was built, there was a further reconstruction. It must have been in about 1950s and 1960s, I don't know exactly when, where they, they re renovated the facade. The, the building is actually built in brick with a, a plaster, a stucco finish, which the stucco was taken off and re rendered. <coughs> and then they, they put in these sort of fake brick stone details, etc., onto it. And the, 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 this inscription, which is to do with who St. Peter actually was, the Vicar of Christ and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you, what's interesting about the Rasno is that these building, this building, apart from this strange office or block of flats, I should say, is the only building of any height in the area. And most of the buildings are one story or the maximum two stories, and it just spreads out into the landscape. It's all to do with agriculture. Uruguay is a, a, a desperately flat land. Um, there's no, virtually no mountain. I don't think there's any mountains in Uruguay. The biggest thing is probably be about 200 meters or something. Um, and this was the church, and you can see the landscape. You can see the side aisles here after the construction. And then there was a fire. Oh, sorry, yeah. This is the, the internal photograph of the church prior to the fire. So it's very much like, uh, if you've been in, in, in Catholic churches, uh, which I've been in a few in the time, but anyway, um, this, was, this is very typical. We have a side aisle here, and then these rows of columns, there's four columns forming this pillar supporting the, the walls, and then there's light windows above here, and then the, the, the altar is very much separated from the, the congregation. Originally, there was a little balustrade along here, and that was typical, and then when Vatican II came in, they decided that that was a wee bit problematic. Who owns the space and all that kind of stuff? So they were taken down and the, the, the altar was moved forward. Originally the altar was at the back here against this big stone frieze. So the priest would actually have his back to the congregation for an awful lot of the time. He wouldn't even know what he's doing and he's speaking in Latin. It was a kind of silly thing. So they changed that and they brought, the, they brought this table forward so that the priest would be facing directly and they opened it up. And the Estes built this idea into the church at the Atlantida, Jesus Christ the Worker. And then there was the fire. And it, you can see the original roof, which is this trust raft, the trust roof, timber trust roof. And there was a big loft space in here. And they, re they reckon that the fire was a combination of birds nesting in the roof space with straw and things like that. And teenagers from the town going there to smoke. This is kind of bizarre. So they would find their way into the, into the loft, smoke it. The bird's nest and whatever caught fire in it. There's quite a, a, a dramatic uh, damage as a consequence, quite, quite severe damage. I mean, the walls look reasonable, the, the walls and columns look reasonably intact, but the roof is really badly destroyed. And the Este, because he had a reputation for building low cost buildings, was involved in <coughs> proposing a reconstruction. And his reconstruction was actually a, a dramatic remodeling. Is virtually, he virtually changed the whole building apart from the front facade. And this was his intervention. So this is, the roof was originally this uh, timber roof construction with a, a false ceiling, a curved plastered ceiling and soffit. And then the, the row of columns, as you can remember, along here, and then the side aisles. And he was working with the footprint of the church so he had to keep it within the original plan of the church. And his proposal was to take away all the columns, rebuild the side walls, rebuild the roof over the side aisle, rebuild the roof over the, the nave, and then build this tower at the back. From what started as a damage to the roof became this complete reconstruction. And it's, it's a remarkable project. I mean, I, 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 I've been looking at this and looking at this and looking at this, and um, each time I look at it again, I find other things that are, I find interesting. Um, and it was all done for an incredibly small amount of money. Incredibly small amount of money. And that's the, that's the church now. So you come in through the front facade. The front facade remains the same. But as you go in, the interior is completely changed. You have these large, solid walls supporting this roof. And the roof is only 8 or 10 centimetres thick. And it's... 
sported off a tower at the back. And the tower brings light in down these inclined walls onto the cross. And then this distance here, where all the columns used to be, I mean, it's unsupported. And the walls, instead of being vertical as they were, and they were inclined inwards. So they're inclined at 10 degrees to the vertical to give a heightened sense of space. And it's truly, a truly kind of spiritual experience when you go to see this church because you, you expect something completely different. There's virtually no windows in it other than this long slit window here and the window above the altar and there's another window as you leave. And it's all the lighting. It's all controlled, very carefully designed. And he wanted, one of the reasons for getting rid of the columns wasn't just to say, I can do this, I'm clever, I'm a good engineer, or whatever. It was actually to try to open up the space. Now, if you remember in the original church, there was these four columns, they occupied a, an area, really quite a large footprint. And they really disassociated the side aisle from the, the, the nave. And the idea was to have the space as much to do with the people as possible, open up the altar as much as possible. And so he was following the ideas of Vatican II in, in this construction. And in doing so, they had to re resolve the, 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 the issue with the columns. And also, when you look at this, to heighten the sense of a single space, He's really trying to get the brickwork to look as if it's a continuous surface all the way through. So where the nave wall meets the, this tower at the back, it runs seamlessly onto that. Where the roof of the side dial, which is reconstructed, meets the wall, that's a continuous surface of brick. He's trying hard and hard as possible to, to make it feel one material, one continuous material. And if you look here, you can see perhaps more effectively, this is from one side there looking across. And actually, you can trace the joints of the brick from this wall along here and all the way up, and they're continuous. And then as they run across there, there's continuous, there's no break in construction, no visible break, but they actually are different pieces of construction. So it's very minimal in its expression of structure, but it's very reliant on its rational development of the structure. And it's, it's quite, quite a, a remarkable building. And one of the things that I find really quite remarkable about it is when I, I look at this, you see that these are the, this is the soffit of the roof of the side aisle. This is the end of the side aisle wall, a gable to that. And this wall is inclined at 10 degrees to the vertical. The bricks here, are laid in this stack bond, but they're all laid at the same angle as that wall. So it's 10 degrees. But all these bricks are laid at that point. And yet when you trace these lines all the way around, there's no break in the lines. But these bricks are running that way in terms of the long dimension and running that way in terms of the long dimension. And yet they're at an angle. But they, these lines run around in a horizontal plane and in a vertical plane. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And it's an obsessive detail, it really is. I've been to see this building three times, and it was only the third time that it clicked exactly what they had done. And what they'd done is that actually this last brick is actually two bricks, but it's so carefully constructed you can't see it. That actually has to change angle, that has to shift. That half brick here has to shift by 10 degrees in a plane, and you can just about pick it up there. It's the most remarkable piece of construction, so carefully, carefully executed. At the same time, at this point, the whole weight of that wall is transferred there. That wall weighs 200 tonnes, so it's carrying an enormous amount of load, but there's no suggestion that it's having to do that. But it has to do that, otherwise it would collapse. So it, the structure is subservient to the expression of the space, to the expression of the surface. And the surface is there to give a sense of unity to the space. So there's a trail of rational logic which leads to this construction. 
And it's not about saying I'm really clever. It's not about Santiago Calatrava saying, look at my expressively exaggerated <coughs> and expensive structure. It's not about that at all. It's about the space and the, the use of the space to, to do, deal with the building. And it's really quite profound. And then you see the effect of this. And, and, and as I say, the SDA, he was quite a devout Catholic. And a lot of his sons and children are not really devout Catholic. They were really fed up with him because he was quite um, dogmatic about certain things, about going to Mass and not listening to pop music or watching TV or whatever. So he could have been a quite a difficult parent, I think. But um, nevertheless, he, he, he had a sense of what he was trying to do. And people have described his work as his Catholicism is more mystical and intellectual rather than devotional. Because one of the things he also did is, if you remember the slide of the original church, he stripped it of all of the, 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 the statues that were there. The church was full of statues of St. Peter, of Jesus Christ, of the Virgin Mary, of lots and lots of people, lots of iconic representation of, of Catholicism, and he completely stripped that. And, the, and what gives it its sense of spirituality is the is the, the, the light, the expression of the light against the brick surface. Previously, the, the, the building had been built of brick, but it had been covered with stucco. So it was still built of the material of Uruguay, the brick, but it was suppressed. And then he uses that and expresses that, but in his careful construction, raises it to a different, a different level. And then when you turn to go out of the church, What's remarkable is that you see this window. So these are the inclined walls. This is the roof, which is sitting just above the wall. There's little stubs that connect one to the other, but you don't see them. And this window is remarkable when you look at it, because it's now facing out onto the original facade. And when you look close to it, that's actually built with bricks as well. And it's a series of hexagons that are supported of these steel rods that are built into the side of the, the wall here. It's a concrete frame that supports that behind the, the brick skin. But these are, these are five centimeter thick brick slabs and they're just carried literally by a series of six steel rods at each of the junctions of the side. And it's a remarkable building, remarkable construction very carefully done, but it resets the, the space. It follows the space, follows the roof, it follows the walls. So it fits and it accentuates that and it's lit from the, the window at the front. And behind all this is, 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 the, is the really careful construction. So the wall is a total of 27 centimeters in thickness. There's a brick skin, which you see the brick running from the soffit of the roof, of the side dial, into the, the walls of the nave. And then there's a, 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 a layer of 15 centimeters of concrete, which is on the outside. And then here, at this point, we can see here, is a series of pre-stressed cables. So the whole wall is pre-stressed. And it's pre-stressed in a similar way to the way that they pre-stressed the vaults in the in the, in the barn vaults, a, a series of loops that are anchored into the brickwork. They're tied into the brickwork. These loops are about two meters long and they're tied into the brickwork and they're stretched to the midpoint and they overlap. So you have a loop coming like that and then another loop coming like that and there's an overlap. And into that you put a jack that pushes them apart. So it's very similar in principle to the other jack, but it's designed to suit the, the walls themselves. And I don't know if, it, yeah, this is the jack here. Again, this is a jack that he designed himself. And it uses a, a jack that's used to repair trucks, basically. This is a jack that a, a truck driver would use to replace his tires. And by putting it into the steel frame, as you push down, it pushes these two pieces apart. And you have a loop of steel coming in that direction, and a loop of steel coming in that direction. It's very carefully measured and constructed so they know exactly how much the space in between is and what the change in space will be. And I've checked, I've went through the, the original calculations for this. And by pushing this down and you push the two against each other, 
you stretch the wires, and then once you get the required extension, you put a steel block in between that it stops the wires coming back. It just locks the force, and then it's covered with the concrete. So the concrete's there to protect the steel, and the steel is there to pre-stress the brick wall. And the same principle applies to the, the roof as well. Same technique is applied. Well, I haven't got time to go into that, but it's, it's the same, same basic process. So it's very carefully constructed, very carefully engineered. The window, when we look at this, this is one of the few areas where, I don't know what these black spots are, but um, they weren't on the ridge. Anyway, you've got a series of plates of brickwork hung from these wires. And the critical condition is how they start to bend. Now, this is different from all these other structures, and this is not an efficient structure. There's a lot of bending in it. With a form active structure, a catenary, you should get very little bending in the, in the thing. But because of this following the shape of the, the space itself, then actually these pieces want to get into bending. So we did a computer model of this, and we drew the bending moment diagram, and you get the maximum bending occurs at that point here, between that plate and that plate. It's tending to, to bend like that. And these are, again, uh, 50 centi uh, five centimeters thick with some four or five, six millimeter diameter bars in it. And we were intrigued about this because we, th we thought, well, does that, does that make sense? Does that seem strong? And so we built a version of this using the same bricks as we used before, the half scale bricks. So these are 35 mil. We actually built a, a sample of this slab, <coughs> this brick slab with some six mil bars in it, you can just see them there. So this is halfway through construction. And then we tested it. We put a big weight on the end, this is 70 kilos. So it's just sitting from that, it's clamped to the side of this workbench. And it didn't crack. And by correlating the, the bending here and the bending here, this has got twice the stress that that's exposing. So it verifies that it works, remarkably tough material, which we, did, we thought if it was conventional bricklaying mortar, it would just fall to bits. But it doesn't, it's very strong. And we, we haven't f tested this to failure yet, but it, it should get at least a margin of two on it. This is quite interesting. And it's useful for us to do these things because we can do them at Edinburgh, we have nice workshops. Um, it just gives you a better understanding of the processes and whatever that the Estes experienced. We're not just taking from what he says, but validating it ourselves. Just to finish off with, look at some recent projects. Um, in the 1990s, the Este visits Spain. He was involved with the, the people in, in Alcalá, the university in Alcalá. And they were, they, he was there talking about uh, rehabilitation and patrimony. And one of the persons that he met was the architect for the the Catholic Church in, in Alcala, and they were talking about building a new diocese. And in this new diocese, they said, well, we're going to have to build, I don't know, 10, 12 new churches, but we don't have any money. And they said, well, I've built some churches in, in, in Uruguay, and they've been quite economic, quite effective. So a group of people from Spain, builders, architects, engineers, came to Uruguay, were shown the projects, and they said, well, if you want, you can use our designs. So actually, they built three of his churches in Spain. So if you want to go and see something that looks like a Deste building, then you can do that by flying to Madrid. And it's not that far. It's about 30 kilometers from Madrid. There's a nice train line from Atocha to take you there. And three churches were built following his designs. And then there was a further three churches have been built, taking the, the design that be, and using the technology and building them locally. And it's really interesting because Yesti developed his own techniques because he didn't want to rely on people from outside of Uruguay. Quite internalized in the sense that he developed his own techniques for pre-stressing and construction and whatever, developed his own methods of structural analysis. But then towards the end of his career, he finds that that's been taken back by the developed world because of the values that had been developed in his own projects. 
So there are three churches which are, 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 are translations and copies of his own projects. So there's one which is a copy of Jesus Christ the Worker, which is very similar to, to, to the, the church in, in Atlantida. There's another one which copies San Pedro, which is slightly smaller, slightly scaled down. But what was really interesting was the detail that we talked about, what I talked about, about running around, and you can see that they, they didn't know how to do that. Builders were different. And that's really a big change. You can see the offset. You can see the change in angle. You can see the tapering in the cut brick. Quite interesting. And then the, the most interesting project of the three is San Juan de Avila in Alcala itself. And this was a project that was never ever finalized in, in Montevideo. It was a church, a project for a church that, that, that ran out of money. So the only part built it. But the design was there, and they took the design to Spain. And it's really quite a remarkable church. It's got elements of Atlantida, and it's got elements of Durazno with the tower and the undulating walls. But it's quite different. And the, the walls here are really quite remarkable because in Atlantida, the walls start from a straight line at the base and then undulate as they get to the top. This starts with the undulation at the base, but then it shifts half a wave as it gets to the top. So this curve is going that way and the other curve is going that way. So one curve is curving that way and the other one is opposite to that. So the, the peaks of the curves are half a wave out of sync and they're actually different sizes as well. Straight line in the middle. Yeah, there's a straight line here. There's a straight line here. There's also a, an interesting line here. <laughs> Because it, the walls undulate like this, but then they meet the tower at the back, which is a truncated cone. So that's an inclined cone. So this undulated surface has to reconcile itself with the cone, because it's seamless, as you see here. Oh man, just, oh, just here. So this is the undulated wall, this is the cone, this is the cone here. And there is a, a point where they share the same line. And that's where they meet. So it's carefully, carefully organized. And then the roof is also going like that. It's a Gaussian vault. Uh, the walls were constructed similar to Atlantida independently, but they're taller. And then this is the plan. So this is the line at the base. This is the line at the wall, <coughs> at the top of the wall. This is the edge beam that you see in Atlantida as well. But you can trace this line all the way around as a continuous surface, all the way around and back, apart from that door, back to the front. So it's a continuous surface. There's no side dials in this church. They didn't need side, they didn't want side dials. That's something which was an anathema to them, which he tried to get rid of in, in Durazno. But when you're inside, it's really quite dramatic. Really quite, you know, the roof is the Gaussian vault again, meeting the undulated curved surface of the walls. And then it curves up and meets this tower. And they put this big cross shaped window there and perforated the roof with a series of circular lights. It's quite a remarkable construction. And if you ever find yourself in Madrid, it's really worth, worth a visit. We were there last year. And um, it's funny because uh, Alcala is quite a famous historic city. It's, supposed to be the birthplace of Cervantes who wrote to um, Don Quixote and they have a, they've had a major um, restoration to the, the old town centre and I had not been to this church for I don't know 18 years and I couldn't actually remember where it was and we went to the tourist office to ask they didn't know where it was either it's really bizarre and, and, and I said to the guy well, why do you not know where this church is well, I don't know it. And, and I said, well, Google it. So we Googled it in the church. In the, not in the church, in the, the tourist office. He says, oh, yeah, I know that church. That's where my sister was baptized. And I said, but why is it not part of your, your heritage? And it's really bizarre. It's quite, you know, it, it's just a working church. And so um, I find that quite odd. That people sometimes don't see what's, what they have in their own um, backyard. And you can see it looking back from the, 
the choir loft into the space itself, you get this remarkable effect of the walls undulating around, forming the, the, the chancel and the altar, and then the roof undulating and curving up. So it's, it, the, 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 the geometry is very, very complex. The practice is, although the SD died 20 years ago, the practice in the firm is still working. So this was a project that they did. It's an open-air theatre. It's essentially a, a large truncated barrel vault, single curve, and it's, it's used for outdoor concerts or whatever. And then more recently, they built this open-air theatre, which is only two or three years old, and it's a, a doubly curved Gaussian vault. Um, Again, really quite minimal in a big open public park. It's quite quite remarkable, and, and it's good to see that the firm is still is still working. Uh, some of the original people are still there, actually. Well, well he's ninety three. <laughs> he's a bit deaf, <laughs> so um, he's not working anymore. He retired a while ago, but uh, the, 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 there's plenty of people that they can get to work for them. They had about four or five people that they called the captains that um, the SD trusted very carefully with the execution of these projects. Vittorio is the, is the most well known. Um, but the, the, the staff there, uh, they're not really what you would call a commercial company. I mean, they, they, they're there to make some money, but they actually are much more interested in the projects. Um, and they're still on the go. So that's my, my presentation. He called this thing, this bringing together of the architecture, the materials, the innovation, the structure, cosmic economy, where you're bringing everything to bear from different sources to, to try to make the buildings as, as, as meaningful as possible. And you know, it, there's a completeness that comes when you integrate structure and architecture and construction. And he was not interested in being a, 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 an audacious structural engineer. For his, own, for his own sake, it was actually about the projects he wanted to create. There's quite a lot of discussion about you know, people like Eisler and uh, Nervi and whatever people call it structural art, and I find that a very uncomfortable <coughs> expression. Because why is it not just art? If it's art or it's structure, it's structure. Why should there be something specific about that? And the SD would not really be comfortable with the title of a structural artist because it was beyond just the simply the structure. Which is not to say that he didn't make incredibly interesting structures, he did, but it was always to fulfill another role. And in doing so, he creates this sense of, he tries to express what he calls cosmic economy. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know if anybody wants to ask any questions. Or Mm -hmm. Which is more convenient. Yes. All the other structures seem to have on on the ceiling, maybe this is my kind of lack of knowledge of the structure, but the ceiling seems to be on a grid. Yes. And the walls seem to look like bricks as well as I know it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I don't quite understand how your experiment works. How do you Well well, that's, that's what we wanted to test. That's why we did it. And well, it's, it's, there's, there's some small steel bars in it, but they're only like six millimeter diameter. But what we would say is that when we are looking at it, it's a very particular type of concrete. So if you think about what concrete is made of, it's made of cement, sand, and stone. So you have very fine, you have less fine, and then you have coarse material. And it's there to try to fill the spaces in between. And it's, it's a recipe. And it, in this case, it's a recipe where the aggregate is really, really big. And he's using the cement and the sand to bond it all together, which is very different from bricklaying. Because bricklaying, you're relying on its own weight to compress and keep it in place. Yeah, the one at the end, it's all on the grid. Yes, yes. And, and, and you know, when we, see, when we looked at the window, I mean, you can test this, and I did my PhD on brickwork and all this kind of stuff. Um, but there's nothing like trying it for yourself to see that if it works or not. And we expected it to work, but we were surprised how well it worked.
to be honest. And there's not so much one can talk about that particular detail. I mean, in order to get the window to, to stay in place, the, the bars have got to be really tight. And it's actually quite difficult if you just stretch the bars, there the, the, the would be a natural sag in the bars and, and the window would be. So they were separated and then welded together in a very particular way that actually tensioned the bars as well. And then the sequence for construction of that is really very sophisticated. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, well, there's, there's a whole pile of things. I think that, that, that in Uruguay, when he was doing this, and effectively he would self-certify the project, he was undertaking the design and the construction. So if it collapsed, it was his fault. He, and and what would, what's really difficult in, in the UK and, and in Europe is the heavily codification based approach to, to structure, which would say you have to be able to show that it works um, without actually having to build it first. And that, no, it wouldn't be models, it would be through the calculation and through process. I mean, in the, the, what's also not seen in, in the church in Spain, the version of San Pedro, is that there's a big concrete beam that's carrying the wall, rather than actually using the, the wall as the beam as, as the SD used. So the, that, I think, was to do with reconciling the, the natural conservatism of the Spanish authorities with the design that, 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 that the SD had proposed. And it's the least successful of the translations to, 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 to Spain, actually. It's, 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 it's not the same. It's not the same. It's a, also, it's a slightly smaller scale. So the light is a bit stronger and, and the contrast in the lit spaces is different. So it doesn't, and also, they didn't have an original facade, you know, that, that, that the Este was responding to. So they've, they, there's a big plastic window at the front. It's kind of odd. I didn't want to show that. But when there was a proposal to build a building in front in order to allow at the model of the conditions that he had in 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 in, in Spain in Uruguay and San Pedro, well, completely, yeah, yeah, completely. Sorry, hi. Yes. 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 No, there are bars. The bars are. They're, 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 it's actually two layers of brick, so it's a, it's a double thickness, and the bars are in the space between. And then there's a the whole series of ring bars as well. So there's a lot of reinforcement. I mean, it's all small bars. It's all small diameters, but there are bars running vertically as well. There has to be, a, you know, otherwise it, 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 it's, so, it's such a slender, it's such a slender structure. Yes. Oh no! I mean, it, it, it's, it's it's so ridiculously different. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, it, you can always bend it with your hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, we we. I mean, I, I as I say, I've done a lot of research on structural brickwork in the past and and pre-stressing and all the rest of it, and, uh, which actually brought me into the estate to some extent, but. Um, it is remarkable how effective it is. And what we did is we had a magnifying glass. So each time we put another increment of load on it, I checked at the point of maximum bending to see if I could see a crack. And at 70 kilos, kilos, I could see a hairline crack through the magnifying glass. So it would take more load. It would open quite a bit before it would actually crush. But you actually get the bars that have got to be in the center because there's contraflexure. Uh, so your lever arm into the bar is only about... Uh, less than 15 millimetres. No, no, it's not normal mortar. It's a one to two and a half sand coarse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's a coarse sand. So it's much, much stronger than, than a mortar. Much, much stronger. So your cement's got a lot more bond to everything. And also, what, two or three times we've built these things, the, the, this, the, the thing stiffens up so quickly within 10, 15 minutes of placing the mortar that we have to soak everything. And we're not wanting to soak it because we want, we want it, the, that thing to happen, but it doesn't work. You can't you don't even have time to lay the mortar properly. And, 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 and so it verifies that, but also you can see that, that you're getting a, in, you're, 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 the brick is trying to get as strong a bond as it can. 
with the with with the grout basically. It's not really a mortar; it's a grout really, you know. But then, if you look at that and you calculate the amount of cement in the wall in relation to what it would be if it's a concrete wall, you're still saving about fifty uh, percent of the cement, you know, easily. It's still a relatively small amount. So that's why it's like a kind of a very particular concrete where you're predetermining the sizes of the, 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 the coarse aggregate and you're making them much bigger than sort of 20 mil. Yes, yes. No, it's, it's, it's not really contributing because it depends on the sequence of pre-stressing. In the slide that you saw there, they left a space in the in the in the the uh, top of the vault, and, and but you're actually largely pre-stressing the brick, and it, you have to leave a space in order to stretch the wires. So there's no concrete there until the, the, the so it's really pre-stressing the brick as much as possible. And 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 if you compare it with a, a the, the 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 single coverage of vault that we experiment that we did. Then there's no there's no skin on top of that, and and it's all the compression in the brick. So provided you can compress the brick, it it, it works. And and because the brick is lighter than the concrete, you need less pre-stress. Because you're keeping the brick as thin as possible, you need less pre-stress. So it's a, it's a virtuous uh, cycle, really. You know, you get advantage of the material, you get advantage of the weight of the material by keeping it as thin as possible. You need as less reinforcement. And so on and so forth. So it, 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 it's very difficult to be um, to find a, a rational reason for not doing it. It, it, it. But it just takes that effort to to, to have the vision to see. And and the, what I think is quite interesting is that that he had such a lot of faith in his ability to analyze and calculate. You know that that, that he he trusted that. You know, and but you saw that he was testing it by looking at how the vaults behaved when they took the formwork away and whatever. Which is, which is quite interesting. And as I said, the, the two books that he wrote were uh, technical books about how he built what he was doing. Yeah, they're, they're I've got a copy of both of them, but if you, so I can send bits to you if you want to. Yeah, but um, yeah, it's interesting. And as I say, we did a study to compare his buckling analysis with, with, a, with a FE model, you know, to look at buckling, and, and, and they were quite close. But the deflections in these things are really small. You know, they're like half a half a centimeter or something. They're really, it's an incredibly stiff construction once it's all in place. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't think so. I mean, um, I know that the Estes firm, as they were, were evolving, shared the, uh, 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 the same building as a group of architects, and he, he had a sense of what was going on. But I've always, I mean, people have said on three or four occasions that the, the Church of Atlantida is like a uh, wrong show. There's elements of that. But if you know how, if you look at how Rongchamp is built with the layers and surfaces and whatever, it's so completely different. And the SD section that, that you, uh, and the elevation is actually the section of the building. You know, so you're seeing the thickness of the walls expressed on the elevation. And so they come from a completely different route, as far as I can see. And, and, and there, is a, there is a way of looking at completely from a, a mathematical or a structural perspective as to how they've been formed. So there's virtually no decoration in his buildings. There's nothing applied. And when he did the church at San Pedro, he took out all of the, 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 the iconography of the church. I mean, the people are putting it back in slowly, slowly. So each time I've been to see it, there's been another statue added from the, the locker, you know. This is quite interesting. So people actually like icons, it turns out. <laughs> but, Yes. All right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know whether it's because people see things or whether, you know, but, but you, you know, you can find a root in this which comes from the form. Yeah, it comes from the geometry. You know, and, and the Gaussian vault, if you say, well, how can I make a, a, a roof span as much as possible with the least amount of material? I make it a catenary arch. You know, and, and, and that, that's what does it, you know. And, and, and then how do I develop that? You, you know, so people have done this. So Fresney did it with these big aircraft hangers. But Fresney was a bit, a bit more lumpy than a lot of the things that he did. But there's an, there's an argument there, you know, and you see it in the bridges of Robert Meyer and various people, how understanding of the form influenced the expression of the, of the building or the structure in its own, its own right. So there's a project by, um, by uh, Robert Meyer, which was a, a, a big hall for a, a, a Swiss festival in the 1930s or whatever, which is a big barrel vault with a big stiff edge beam in concrete. And um, I'm pretty sure that that's based purely on the, on the graphic statics that he would have used to, to develop the form. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think these are interesting questions. Uh, but I... I, I I, I think it's unlikely. I honestly think it's unlikely because, because I mean, he 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 um, he. One of the reasons, he, if he did that, he would be much better known than he than 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 he, he would have been. You know, he didn't promote his work as an architect would promote it. He really didn't, and 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 so therefore, um, he was this thing about resolving each problem independently is really at the heart of what he did. So. If you wanted to buy pre-stressing jacks from America, these are going to cost a lot of money, but they're not suited for what he wants to do anyway. You know, they, they, normally with pre-stressing, you, you gather all the forces together and you have a big piece at the end with lots of bits of steel and stuff like this. And, and so he, he wanted to distribute it. And in doing so, to keep the thinness of the, the building. So that those systems didn't even work for him, but let alone that he could afford it, which is another, another matter. So I, I think that a, a lot of his work was very, um, was very sort of inward looking, in a, in, not in a, a negative kind of a way, but because he didn't really need to have the, 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 the resources. And, and there's an area of his work, which if I have ever have more time, I'll, I'll really look into it, which is this relationship between his Catholicism and his understanding of physics. You know, because it, 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 there, there seems to be a contradiction there. But but the, but that 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 that's quite quite interesting, you know. That, that he really relied on these this mathematical understanding of form and force and stress, and he he exemplified that in his buildings because they're so minimal. But at the same time, the forms he created were, were had a particular quality. I feel, you know, so it's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Economy. Yeah. So, okay, thanks very much. Thank